Hi, thanks for tuning in to another edition of Front Porch Conversations. We're here this morning on the porch at the Copeland Community Center. And our guests today are Annabelle and Chris Christensen. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank We're you. happy to be here. Yes. Isn't it a lovely spot this morning? It is. Mm. Beautiful to hear the birds. And the weather is fantastic. Well, now that we know who you are, in case you needed an introduction here at the village, um, why don't you let our viewers know where you were born and where you grew up? Okay. Who's first? You go. Okay. Well, I was born in Nourishell, New York in 1940 and uh, grew up there and uh, went to elementary, high school, so forth. And in my, was it sophomore? No, junior year, I met Annabelle. Um, and uh, we have been together since that time. Uh, she was 14, I was 17 at the time. And uh, I don't know if we want to tell how we met, but... Well, let's, uh, let's find out where Annabelle <laughs> came from. <laughs> I thought he would at least tell us that he came from a family that where his father came from Germany and came right. over. So um, I, I was born in Brooklyn uh, to immigrant parents uh, who came from Italy and... Um, System. We then moved to the Bronx. That was like moving uptown. <laughs> and then we moved to the country. That was New Rochelle. And that is where I went to the high school that my father went to as a young man and met Chris. Hmm. And how, is, by being in school is how you met? Yes. Yeah. He yeah. carried my books. Oh, good. Yes. Yeah. Actually, I was uh, I was the friend of the guy that was going out with Annabelle at the time, uh, and uh, you just took the books and pushed him away? Huh? It, it uh, went from there. <laughs> <laughs> what are some childhood memories for both of you, special mm -hmm. memories? Well, my dad, my dad was a butcher in New York, had a butcher shop right on US 1 in, the, in New Rochelle. And uh, my mom, they're both from Germany, both sides of my family are from Germany. My dad's from Flensburg. My mother's family's from Hamburg. She was born in New Rochelle, but my dad was born in, in Germany. Came over when he was uh, 17. Um, but uh, I remember uh, going to the butcher shop on Saturdays and, and, and helping out in the back room and, and uh, doing all the dirty jobs, you know, <laughs> but, but enjoying it and getting a chance to meet a lot of different people. Um, um, my dad was very supportive of me. Uh, it's just my sister and I. She's two years younger than me. And um, uh, although he worked, the only time he had off was on Wednesday afternoons. And my greatest memory with him is on Wednesday afternoons when I would come home from school, he'd be in the backyard tending his garden. He was an avid gardener and grew uh, vegetables and so forth. And there was always, uh, the radio was always going and it was always the Giants, the New York Giants, <laughs> playing baseball at a Ebbets Field. And that was his. But I'd go out there and work with him in the garden. And I learned a lot about, uh, about gardening from there, which I use today. So, yes. Yeah. Well, for me, growing up in the ghetto, that would be uh, Brooklyn, uh, I grew up playing in the streets. And I grew up playing in the alleys. And so uh, I always remember that uh, we would run through the alleys. My grandmother always told us, now, Annabella, you stay out of the alley. Why, Grandma? Because of the boogeyman's there. Well, I would gather all my cousins, and I would say, <laughs> let's go in the alley, and let's go find the boogeyman. And so uh, we'd get to, the, to the, uh, the entrance of the alley, and we'd get sticks, and we'd run through the alley, and we'd bang on all of the garbage cans <laughs> that were in the alley, scaring that boogeyman away. And so growing up in the city, that kind of gave me a, uh, a sense of um, what city life was like. But then I also had country life. And my father took us uh, to the country uh, in the summertime. We had a, a little, what we call bungalow. No indoor plumbing. Uh, and so the outhouse was something that I learned to uh, appreciate. Um, <laughs> And so I had country living also. So I had country living. That was camp for us. Mm -hmm. And my, grand, my father thought that was very important that we would have. And I had a, uh, a full 
childhood and growing up, but my mother always took in strays. Not stray animals, but stray people, stray children, stray uh, things that walked around on, on two legs. And me being the oldest always had to take care of the strays. Um, I remember at, at 14, a neighbor asked me if this little young child I was taking care of belonged to me. I said, no, <laughs> I was only 14. <laughs> so that was my growing up time. And do you have siblings? I do. Uh, actually, I have three half-sisters uh, that my father was married twice, and so he had a family before he married my mother, and then uh, he had me and my brother and my sister. And I felt like when he had me, I didn't know whether I was a middle child or a first child, but I was his fourth daughter. And I thought, oh, he must have said, oh, no, not another girl. <laughs> And did both of you graduate from high school in New Rochelle? Yes, right. we did. Right. And then what happened after high school? Well, I ended up going to Nichols uh, Junior College, and uh, I had joined the reserves, Navy reserves, in high school. Um, and so when I went to Nichols, um, they tried to draft me because I was out of state. <laughs> they tried to draft me and help me fit the quota. And instead, I turned around and, and uh, got a contract with the Navy to go to uh, aviation Electronics School in Memphis, Tennessee, and I, that's where I started my Navy career. And so I was in the Navy for 20, what, 22, almost 22 years. So. Well, you weren't the only one that was in the Navy. I was in the Navy, too. <laughs> uh, however, I, the Navy never thought that wives were part of the baggage, so we were never part of the duffel bag when they packed it up, so mm -hmm. we stayed behind. But I'll tell you a story about about being in the Navy and raising a family. When we were stationed in Puerto Rico uh, and a hurricane would come through, uh, what did you think that Chris would have to protect? The aircraft. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so he would be uh, flying the aircraft off of the island. And guess who he would be leaving behind? <laughs> the wife and the children. So there we had to weather the storm while he protected the aircraft. And I bet in those years of service, you've lived in a lot of different places. We lived in uh, a number, not as many as a lot of military people did. As a matter of fact, we have even civilian uh, friends that traveled more than we did. But I would say we lived in Rhode Island, in Memphis, Tennessee, in Maryland, in Puerto Rico, and in Jacksonville, Florida. We ended up in Jacksonville, Florida, where we, we lived for over 20 years. It's interesting that a number of people we've interviewed for this show have had some time in Puerto Rico. You ought to have a little reunion of people who've lived in Puerto oh, Rico. Oh, right, well, that right. would be a good yeah. thing. Yeah. And maybe it's just fresher in my mind, but I think there have actually been a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've met a lot of people here that have been in Puerto Rico. Uh -huh. oh. yeah. um, Chris, what, what did you do throughout your Navy career? I was an aviation electronics technician, and so uh, for, for the early part of it, um, I was based at uh, McGuire Air Force Base as part of a Navy squadron flying uh, support transports into uh, Germany um, and the northern route and then coming back through the Azores on the southern route, uh, bringing groceries, mail, personnel, and so forth. And then I left there, went back to uh, uh, secondary school um, back in Memphis, and then from there ended up uh, on the Cuban Missile Blockade. Uh, during that session aboard the USS Lake Champlain and then got transferred to Puerto Rico where we supported uh, the Atlantic Fleet Weapons Range with targets and then most of my, a uh, well, major part of my career was at uh, Pax River, Maryland where I spent five years working on development of the uh, P3C ASW aircraft um, and did a lot of private work uh, or I should say uh, civilian work with um, all the supporting corporations that were building parts for that plane. So I traveled a lot for, I was on shore duty and yet I averaged about 180, 195 days a year on the road, but on shore duty. Uh -huh. So uh, left Annabelle alone. Uh, I was truly a, a, a weekend home person. I'd get home late Friday afternoon and I'd leave first thing Monday morning. She wouldn't see me until the next Friday. 
So to when he had I brought to home his dirty clothes. <laughs> yes, until when he had to do his wash again. Yeah. But he is a little modest yeah. because during that time, the military uh, was developing computer systems for the for the aircraft that he was flying to be able to detect um, enemy uh, in in the uh, submarines in in the ocean, and so the the computers would be able to go farther to find them, and so he was one of two men with the military that uh, took one squadron to California with that plane and one squadron to Jacksonville, Florida. And so that's what he did then on the plane. He, if the computer went down, he had to fix it. Um, tell us about your children. I know you have children and grandchildren. We have children and grandchildren, yes. We have four children and uh, gee, I don't know. The, the number of grandchildren keeps multiplying, <laughs> but now they're going into great-grandchildren. So there, there are a number of them, uh, and um, so we have a, a large family. And do your children live nearby? We have one that lives in uh, Orange Park, and then the others are scattered about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, how did you first learn about Advent Christian Village? Well, well that's my story, if I may. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We were attending a, a church in Jacksonville, and uh, we had teenagers, and so I was involved with the youth group, and uh, mid-1980s, mid we just we just heard about um, Camp Swanee, and uh, so I called out here, and I got a hold of somebody, and I think it was, uh, I think it was uh, Mr. Uh, Wayne Hendricks at the time was in charge of the camp. And uh, we arranged to come out here and stay in the, in the two original cabins. We had, I think we had about 12 or 13 youth group members, and then there was a, a, a female adult member from the church and myself. And we came out for the weekend. Um, and so we got here on Friday night. We stayed through, we left Sunday to go back. And uh, just to show you how God works, on the way down 136 coming in from Live Oak, before we got to the 90 degree turn and that last stretch of road, it was overcast, it was uh, early evening, and all of a sudden the sun came, the clouds opened up and the sun came through and what we saw was a cross made through the crowds, through the clouds. So we came and we spent the weekend here and on Saturday, Wayne, I believe it was Wayne, helped us and we did two canoe trips down the river. The first one was a silent trip, no speaking at all. And then the second one, you could scream and yell, do whatever you wanted. And that was Saturday. And Saturday night, five of our students, or five of our youth, accepted the Lord in the firebolt. We had, a, we had our own little group down there. And so that's the first time we saw this. And when I came home, I told Annabelle, I said, that's a neat place, Fawny River. I remember seeing the cattle. I remember seeing the children because of, of the orphanage at the mm -hmm. time and the grapevines. I don't remember any of the other buildings. Um, I don't remember what was there in the 80s, but, but that's what I remember was that. And then um, in uh, 80, slightly right after that, I think it was, I think it was 85 or 86, um, a neighbor of ours where we lived in Orange Park, her husband passed away, and she moved over here. That's Marge Durban. Oh, my goodness. And Margie moved over here. And before she moved, she struck up a relationship with my mother-in-law, who lived down the street from us, in the same development in Orange <laughs> Park. And uh, they got in, they, Margie taught her how to do China painting. Well, we brought Mom out here. And Mom stayed out where Margie used to live on the main road <laughs> in the last unit. Mom stayed there for a week in China painting with Marge. So we'd been back and forth here repeatedly seeing Marge, seeing the manuals. Uh, we knew them and they were here, so we would visit them. And uh, we decided this is where we wanted to come. We'd researched a lot of different retirement areas and we decided this is where we wanted to come. And so uh, initially when we left Jacksonville, we moved to South Carolina for nine, for, for nine years came back and instead of coming directly here we went to Keystone for six years and then finally moved here in 2016. But this was the place we wanted to come all the time, way back into the 80s. 
Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, when you, um, during your life, I know that you've met somebody that most people have never met. Would you tell us that story? You want me to tell you the story about uh, meeting Mother Teresa? Yes. Oh, yes, I would. I'd like to. <laughs> um, there are a lot of other people we've met. Too. <laughs> but, um, well, let's start with her. <laughs> okay. Um, I felt that uh, God wanted us to go on a mission trip. And uh, so I asked Chris, I said, would you like to go on a mission trip? And he said, yes. He said, uh, go with a group. I said, no, just you and I. He said, where will we go? I said, to New York City. He says, well, what's there? I said, well, I'd like to go to two uh, different um, ministries. One, uh, the Sisters of Charity with Mother Teresa, and the other, uh, Times, Tw- Times, Square Church. Times Square Church with um, yeah, David Wilkerson. Uh, David Wilkerson. He said, oh, good. Well, when will we go? I said, oh, in about six months. And so, and, and then he said, okay, good. And he said, are you going to take care of it? I said, well, yes. And, and by the way, I just wanted you to know that I'm praying to see Mother Teresa. He says, really? Right. She lives across the ocean and she doesn't feel well. Well, and I answered him and said, if God could part the sea for Moses, he could bring Mother Teresa over the ocean. And so the six months kind of passed, and we were getting ready, and I did speak with the different um, uh, ministries that the Sisters of Charity had, mm-hmm. and it was decided that we would go to the men's shelter, and it decided that what date we would go. And about two weeks earlier, as I'm still praying about meeting Mother Teresa, my neighbor came, and she knew that I was praying, and she was praying also. She says, Annabelle, have you heard? And I said, heard what? And she said, Mother Teresa is in Washington, D.C. And I said, yes, four hours by train over to New York. We've got her there. And so we went and uh, getting ready to go. And meanwhile, we make our visit. And we're told by numerous people when they heard where we were going down to Spanish Harlem, no, I wouldn't go there. I, would, I don't send my men there. I wouldn't go there. It's dangerous. And even policemen at the, at the train station were telling us that. But I was telling Chris, honey, we're going. Uh, God will protect us. And so we did go, and we got there. And now I should add here that we went the day after we were supposed to go. Now, originally, we were supposed to go on a Monday. And we, we went on going, a Tuesday. We delayed And I completely Tuesday. forgot about my prayer request to God about Mother Teresa. I was just happy about going. And we get there, and it's wonderful. And we're, we're cooking, and we're cutting up the vegetables for the, the, uh, the, the, the residents that are going to come in for the shelter. And we're cutting them up around a big table with a lot of other uh, nuns that were there that were helping. And one leans over and she says, have you heard? Heard what? Mother is here. And I said, oh, that's wonderful. Now I'm thinking of Mother Teresa. No, and, no. you were thinking I mean, Mother Superior, Superior excuse me. Yeah. And I'm still chopping, chopping, chopping. And then I stop and I turned and I said, Mother who? And she said, why, Mother Teresa, of course. And I said, Mother Teresa's here. I started to cry, and I'm telling Chris, honey, Mother Teresa's here. God answered my prayer. I was in the same place as Mother Teresa. Oh, hallelujah, this is wonderful. I went back to cutting and chopping and everything, and she leans over, and she says, would you like to meet her? Well, I was just happy to be in the same vicinity. And I said, meet her? And she said, yes. And I said, oh, of course, honey, come on. We take off our apron and we go and we're standing in the hall and there's Mother Teresa. She's in the little, and she's in a room talking to someone. This little bitty lady all hunched over and we're standing there. I just was so blessed to be able to see her from a distance now. And she comes walking out and she passes me and she stops and she turns and she says, well, daughter, what are you doing here? And I said, well, Mother Teresa, I'm, I'm cutting up the food f- to feed the homeless when they get here. She says, well, then go back to work. <laughs> <laughs> and I felt, oh, my, I got my calling. Me, who doesn't like to cook? I'm having now to cook. 
And I said, oh, wonderful. Went back to cooking, chopping, chopping. And then when it was all over, the little nun says to me, well, would you like to really meet her again? I said, oh, my gosh, once, twice. Oh, this is wonderful. So we did go back. This time, we actually went into the room with her. And she asked us to kneel after she talked to us about our family. She asked us to kneel, and she blessed us. And that was my time of meeting Mother Teresa. But it was my time of praying to the Lord for something that I wanted. It wasn't something I needed, but it was something I wanted. Mm-hmm. And, and it developed my faith to the, to the place that I say now for every prayer, God, if you could bring Mother Teresa across the ocean, you could answer this prayer. What's really interesting about it, Annabelle said, we changed days. When we got to her sister's house in New York, because where we were staying up in uh, Rye, New York, um, something happened. I don't remember what happened, but anyway, we changed. We were supposed to go Monday, and then we were going to go Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And, but something changed, and we ended up going Tuesday. Well, what, we, what really happened was God, God's hand was in the whole thing because Mother Teresa came to that particular place at 6 o'clock that morning for the 6 o'clock Mass. She came up from Washington. In fact, as we walked in off the street into this beautiful, beautiful convent with a fantastic garden and all that, right in the middle of all the hubbub in Spanish Mm -hmm. Harlem, there was a vehicle there that had uh, Maryland plates on it. It was a van. And they had driven her up. She was there from 6 o'clock. She left at 12 o'clock that day, never to return to New York City never to return to the United States when she went back. That was her last trip from India. That was her last trip across the ocean. And then she passed away. But um, also, I had had, always had a dream uh, after reading uh, The Cross and the Switchblade and a lot of other things, a lot of other Christian books, I'd always wanted to meet David Wilkerson or see David Wilkerson. Mm -hmm. And one of the places we went was to Times Square Church. And when we got there, we did some ministry, street ministry there and so forth. So we spent a week, basically a week in New York City doing street ministry and traveling every morning down and never had a problem. Police told us we didn't want, we weren't supposed to go there and everything else. Everybody told us it's not safe and all that. Never had a bit of problem. Never had a bit of problem anywhere. And, And we always felt safe. No concern. I just told Annabelle, I says, don't look anybody straight in the face. But <laughs> other than that, just sit there. And, I, you know, but uh, there were other things about that trip that were just remarkable, how God did different things on that whole trip. So, yeah, it was great. Is there something that you would like to share with our viewers today about a, another special moment in your lives? Well, I'd like to just say that there was one, one uh, thing that I wanted to do that was on my bucket list. And so uh, at 75 years old, I climbed a rock wall. And uh, I figured, well, that's the last thing I wanted to have on my bucket list. And and I was able to do it. And now I'm just doing what's on God's bucket list. And he's kept you pretty busy, hasn't he? That's right. That's right. We have a ministry uh, where we go to the prison here uh, in the area and do a faith-based program. Uh, at two of the different prisons, and um, we also go to the chapel with the inmates. We've missed them with mm. this mm. not being mm-hmm. able to go for the virus, mm. um, but we're the only non-inmates, and I'm the only woman. Mm. So that's and I bet they're blessed. Uh, oh, we, are yeah. blessed. we are blessed. We are blessed. We are blessed. We are blessed. That's one of the things we're anxiously waiting for things to open up. The prison's locked down now. It has been now for about six weeks. And uh, even even the men are not allowed to go to the chapel at Taylor Correctional. Mm-hmm. They're 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 sequestered in their own units, and uh, the only time they get out is to go to the chow hall, the mess hall, whatever you want to call it, to get you know to eat. Uh, but we're anxiously waiting to get back. We've got uh, two different programs we're running, both at the main and the annex, and uh, we've. Over the four years that we've been involved in this, Annabelle's been involved in it for about a year and a half. Uh, Helmut Seidenberg and I were the two partners together for the last four years. And we've worked with about 250 to 300 men over that time period. Uh, 
So part of my bucket list is to get back there because I've got some men that are anxious to be trained so that they can be facilitators in the programs that we're doing inside the prison um, and continue to further that, that movement. Uh, it, it is, it's been such a blessing. Their love uh, for the Lord is infectious. Yeah. That's yeah. what I would say. Yeah. And we see, we see hearts changing, we see minds changing, we see behavior, behavior changes. I mean, when you, get a, when you start a class in anger dynamics and the first day is the guy says, I'm always angry, I like it, and I don't want to change. And yet now he's in, our, he's in his fourth course with us. And uh, uh, just as, as um, just a blessing, just a blessing, you know, so. Yeah. Well, I want to thank That's you for like coming do. and joining us today. And um, let's talk again sometime. Yes, we, love we whether, appreciate whether it. A TV thank you so much, Ann. Thank <laughs> and, you. And we wish God's blessing to all of you that are viewing this. And may the Lord bless you individually and corporately. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. And thank you for tuning in again. Look forward to being on the front porch with somebody else soon. So stay tuned.